Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, yeah, I hope to kind of talk through what I was doing on sabbatical, what I was doing on my Fulbright, and kind of one and the same thing. It's good to have a good crowd. I've, I've given many presentations with a much smaller crowd than this at various conferences, as I'm sure all of you have as well. So I, it's, it's always nice to have a healthy audience, healthy size audience. Um, yeah, I just want to kind of walk through and uh, talk through things, and I hope I've timed this out right that I can get through this in 30, 35 minutes and then have time for discussion, uh, reflection, and questions after that. Um, what I want to cover today as I uh, put in my little blurb, basically, I want to start by just talking about uh, just impressions of Norway, because uh, as you hopefully all know, uh, I was, uh, during my sabbatical, uh, received the honor of being a Fulbright Scholar to Norway. Uh, was able to spend six months there doing research, uh, not teaching, just doing research, which is a, a luxury. Um, was able to take my family, and it was uh, a wonderful adventure. I want to talk through a little bit of some of that, uh, but then I'll dive into a little bit more of kind of how I grew professionally while I was there, um, because I think it, it, it grew, grew me in ways uh, that are probably going to see, I guess, fruit uh, in the coming years in both my art making and in my research. And so I'll, I'll kind of hit on both of those topics as well, OK? Um, in preparing for Norway, yes, I expected to encounter Vikings and Viking ships. Uh, this is a shot from the Viking ship Husa in uh, Oslo. These things are massive. They're impressive and when you think about how old they are and that the fact that they were in the ground. Uh, so I, I expected to uh, get my fair dose of uh, uh, Viking culture. Uh, I expected there to be fjords, yes, and the fjords are uh, excellent. The fjords are, are beautiful. I mean, there's, it's, there's something majestic about being on a river surrounded by these cliff walls as you're kind of uh, floating down the river. Uh, but I did not expect that their pedestrians would be so well dressed. <laughs> okay. um, this was, a, I, I, it's, it's fun kind of uh, observing different signs as, as kind of a, a, I guess, a small minutia of detail, the things that stand out to you when you're a, a foreigner in a foreign country, basically. Uh, and this is one of the pedestrian signs. They're, they're slowly re uh, replacing these with the more uh, bland-looking, circular uh, pedestrians that we have uh, here. But there's still a few of these older signs around with these really well-dressed, snappy, uh, uh, secret agent-looking uh, pedestrians, basically. Uh, People have asked me if I've learned a little Norwegian, and I can say, yeah, yeah, I speak a new norsk, yeah. And I've learned a few, a little bit, how to say a few things. If you catch me in the halls saying hi, uh, it's not because it's uh, how they say hi in, in Norwegian. Basically, there's a kind of drawn out, almost two syllable way that they say hi. Uh, this is not me, uh, you know, I don't know, some sort of vocal tick or anything like that. It's kind of a, I guess, residual of, of being in Norway for six months. Uh, I did. Worked through language lessons. I found the Pimsleur language lessons to be very, uh, very, very good in terms of learning Norwegian. Um, but I thought it was a, an interesting omen that the second adjective, or second or third adjective that they taught me was the word for expensive. Uh, <laughs> so this is der for dit. That's this is too expensive, basically, uh, which is a very useful phrase when you're out shopping in Norwegian culture. It is a very expensive country to be in. Uh, uh, prices are very high. Uh, part of them being a very robust oil economy. Uh, part of them having one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in Europe still, even after this, these years of recession, basically. Uh, but I, I thought it, it's interesting how that, that's kind of worked its way into the, the actual language lessons, the word for uh, expensive. Um, in terms of food, yeah, I can say that I adapted, basically. Uh, anybody that knows me knows that I have a, a very fond uh, uh, place in my stomach for peanut butter. Uh, and they had some good... Uh, peanut butter that was relatively inexpensive, that uh, didn't have a lot of the additives, the high, partially hydrogenated stuff that we find in our American peanut butter. Um, I also, I, I left for Norway a bagel person. And it's very hard to find bagels in Norway. So I adapted to these Wasa crisp breads, basically. And that's, that's I think, a part of my diet that will probably stick. Because thankfully, when I come back, I came back, I discovered that Publix does stock Wasa crackers, basically. So I'm able to keep, although they have, they have four varieties. The typical Norwegian gr uh, grocery market has at least 20 different kinds of, of wasa crackers. Uh, I do have a photo somewhere else. I can show you some other time of the, the wasa display in the grocery store, basically. Uh, and then uh, these oatmeal uh, cookies that are kind of sweet havre uh, They come in a kind of a tube like this, basically. Uh, they're very, uh, very, very tasty. Uh, my girls and I got fond of, uh, I mean, they're, they're kind of a good treat, if you will, healthy enough. Uh, my girls and I got fond of saying that a Bix it'll fix it, 
if you're, if you're in a bad mood, basically. Um, speaking of my girls, uh, we all got outfitted in our Norwegian rain gear uh, as part of this. Uh, part of living and working in Bergen for six months, uh, they have a weather pattern in Bergen on the west coast uh, that's very similar to like Seattle, if you will. So if you think of Seattle and the northwest, the kind of rain uh, that bombards that region of the country, uh, Bergen is much the same way. I think there's one stretch where we went something like 21 days without seeing the sun, not because it was not rising, but because it was overcast for those 21 days. Uh, so we all had to upgrade our rain gear uh, over the course of the six months, and actually uh, pretty quickly in the beginning of that six months. Uh, I trashed a pair of shoes uh, going out on a hike because uh, my, my nice, comfortable Skechers with all their stitching is uh, exactly the wrong kind of uh, footwear. So I have nice, uh, uh, these are my upgraded Norwegian uh, footwear basically here that are um, like Gore-Tex coated basically and they're good for uh, walking around in the rain, that sort of stuff, which is very important in Bergen. Uh, but when the sun does come out, the surroundings in Bergen are breathtakingly beautiful. It's a city of about a quarter of a million people that's nestled in, an, in a, a valley surrounded by mountains, basically, uh, where you have uh, houses kind of going up the mountainside. Um, I, I mean, it just, it's a very drastically different uh, geography than we find here in Florida, yes, where we have kind of flat uh, uh, landscape, yes. Uh, having mountains was kind of a, a nice change of pace for six months. Uh, being that close to the ocean uh, was a nice change of pace for for six months. Um, although, I mean, we're we're close to the ocean here, but we were literally, you know, it, it's right there on the harbor, basically. Um, in terms of the, some of the horizon shots, I mean, watching the sunset and rise at various times of day, because the days days do get very short there. Uh, are, are somewhat breathtaking uh, kind of visuals that you find on the horizon. So at the top, we had that's, that's the North Sea. Uh, this uh, middle shot is Titivanet, which was near our uh, apartment where we were living. Uh, and the bottom uh, was at Tromso. We were in Tromso in December when the, the daylight is, almost, is maybe two hours, basically, and the sun just kind of peaks over the horizon and then goes back down. But it, it, in the meantime, it gives you these kind of breathtaking oranges uh, uh, and pink colors on the horizon. And the mountains, which are covered in snow, are these kind of breathtaking blue colors. Uh, it's quite beautiful, breathtaking surroundings. I, can't, I could go on for another half hour just talking about that, basically. Uh, but needless to say, we had a good time in Norway. And it was a, it was a good place to be, uh, a very different climate. And we learned a lot from that experience. Um, from the Fulbright program, I can say that the Fulbright program in Norway is very well organized. Uh, the support staff in the Oslo office is very helpful uh, without being intrusive because they realize they're working with people that are there researching uh, on their own agendas, basically. They're there to, as a true support staff. They're there when you need them. You call them up and they, they can help you work through various issues. Uh, but when you need them to stay out of your way, they, they just kind of fade into the background and you can do your work, basically. One of the things that they did really well uh, was at early on in August, we had a gathering of everybody that was a Fulbright scholar in Norway. That's what this picture is, basically. This is my view from the end, um, looking at the rest of the crowd uh, based, uh, in that room, uh, getting to know each other. Um, I think that, more than anything, having an experience like that at the beginning of the Fulbright experience, where we got to know everybody that was in the country, all of the Americans that were there studying, working, doing different things, um, became a real rewarding part of the experience because it instantly gave us a network across the country that we could call on. When we got an invite to go to another university to give a lecture, basically, we had somebody we could call up to go out to dinner, to maybe crash on their couch, to maybe that sort of thing. Uh, it, was, it was good to have that network. Um, and I think that's, I think, a unique part of the uh, Fulbright experience. I know that not every country uh, has such a, a large group of Fulbrighters, uh, but the ones that do, um, Having an experience like this right at the beginning, where we kind of gelled as a group, and we're still we're we're still all in a Facebook group together, trading things like that. that uh, I'm kind of jealous now, looking at their ski weekends that they're still going on as the snow is still on the ground. But um, it was a good group of people to uh, uh, get to know, and I, I'm certainly that there are some uh, lifelong friends among this group that we'll, we'll, I will we will stay in touch with over the years. Um, being a Fulbright scholar in a country, uh, being an American visiting scholar, there are instantly multiple opportunities to present your work, okay? Uh, and uh, even it, when you uh, don't intend to ask about presenting your work, if you just simply say, hey, I'm here, I'm an American scholar, can I come visit? 
visit inevitably turns into, oh, can you come talk about your work and talk, uh, you know, present a little few things. So I, I had multiple opportunities as I submitted that, I guess, longer list to Karen of all the presentations that I did over, over my sabbatical, basically. Uh, but it, it was, a, I mean, it was a fun experience, getting to know different people, getting to uh, hear different people's perspective on, on what it is I do um, as a music technologist, as a computer musician. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, no, this, I'm not getting a Nobel Prize, but this is, uh, this is the podium where they announced the winner of the Nobel Peace. The, yeah, that's the same podium. Uh, we had our initial gathering. We, we uh, had a gathering at the Nobel um, Institute. Uh, yeah, so uh, no. But maybe I should circulate that picture with a different kind of caption, Rusty. Yeah. Um, no, this is the same venue where they announce the, the winner each year, not where they actually give the award, because you know they do the announcement of the Peace Prize and then they do the actual awarding a few months later. Uh, we had our first uh, <coughs> gathering there and we each took turns doing a quick like three minute introduction of who we are and what kind of research we were doing there in Norway. Uh, the ambassador to Norway introduced us and uh, thanked us for being uh, the U.S. ambassador to Norway, uh, who is Barry White, not same, not the Barry White, but his name is Barry White. Uh, he's a very uh, interesting guy uh, and uh, very kind and generous. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these other presentations in a minute. Um, so yeah, that's that's why Alfred Nobel's head is there on, on, in front of me. Uh, having good hosts is invaluable. Uh, and so I can't say enough about my hosts at Beck. Beck is the Bergen Center for Electronic Arts. Uh, it's a small office, not much bigger than the facilities for our digital arts program. But it's a, instead of it being a tied to a university, it's open to the community of artists that are w living and working in Bergen. Uh, and so they kind of uh, register as a member. Basically, they're they're uh, subsidized by the municipality, uh, and artists can kind of come and go through there. Uh, so in addition to my host, this is Lars Ulva Toft on the, the let's see, you guys, the, the left-hand side of this picture. Uh, and the other guy is Trond Losius. Trond is actually the, the researcher that I was interested in working with because we're both on the same research project. Uh, but I can't say enough about how these guys helped us find apartments, helped us find, uh, help facilitate our visits and that sort of stuff. And just being in an environment where artists are coming through, talking about their work, introducing uh, themselves, getting to know people. It was a really uh, stimulating environment to be in, to be meeting people kind of coming through Bergen for all manner of reasons, working on projects uh, that, I, I can't, again, I can't say enough about Beck. Uh, and I hope to get back there uh, someday soon to, to work on more projects, basically. We're working on continuing the conversation as, as it goes. Um, the Fulbright experience on my kids, I think having a five and eight-year-old and being able to take them to a foreign country for six months is invaluable. Um, I, I think their view of the world, especially the eight-year-old, her view of how big the world is, is drastically changed from what it was six, seven months ago, as you can imagine. Uh, you can see her in the bottom there with the map kind of figuring out where we're going, basically. Uh, but also even the five-year-old, uh, I mean, her in these big castles and, and going out on hikes and that sort of stuff, I mean, I really kind of see saw my girls uh, come out of their shell and, and, and mature and grow in these six months in uh, ways that I'm sure are going to impact them in the years to come. Uh, that I, I'm really thankful that we got that opportunity. Um, and I can't say enough about my wife, uh, my partner, my best friend. Um, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of details that she took care of in this process, packing things, uh, making sure we kept appointments, that sort of stuff. And, and um, also, I mean, giving me space to do research when it was raining and she was stuck in the apartment all day, basically, and, and couldn't go anywhere. Uh, I, I can't thank her enough for all the work that she did on this. So, I mean, it really was a, a family adventure, basically. So I, that's why I'm using we a lot, basically, in, in this talk and talking about it. So um, that's Norway and Fulbright in a nutshell. So how did that affect me professionally? Well, my project, my proposal was to do a decidedly technical project. And those of you that were on the professional committee may have remember my application. I was going to do a lot of programming. I was going to put art aside for a little bit. I was going to focus on a technical task because I hadn't really had room to do that. Um, and music technology is, is a discipline that kind of sits in between. There are creative aspects to it. There are technical aspects to it. And you can never really walk totally away from one or the other. Okay, um, And I didn't expect to be impacted as much about my artworking and my creative work as I was. Okay? Um, but I'm thankful that I, um, I knew enough that when opportunities arose, I, could, I was 
cool with putting aside the technical stuff to focus on this creative project every once in a while. Um, and I think my experience was much richer for that decision, basically, to not simply uh, you know, dig in and just work on code for six months, basically. Um, very early on, the first distraction came when uh, my hosts at Beck decided, well, we've got this thing coming up. It's called Be Open. And it's, a, it's an event in Bergen where all the artists register and, and uh, agree to open up their studio for the weekend, basically. Uh, they have set hours where they're going to be in their studio. And anybody who's in the public has the ability. It, it's all advertised. There's an itinerary. There's a map, that sort of stuff. Anybody who's interested from the public can come in and kind of see what's going on in these various artists. It's a very cool event that happens citywide in Bergen. And Beck was looking to program some things. And they said, well, we have this project room in the back. You want to do something in there? And I said, OK. Um, the idea was to do a sound installation. And for those that are not uh, familiar, a sound installation is more where you kind of set up a speaker system, set up a sound piece, and you let it run over hours and hours and hours, rather than a fixed kind of time-based work where it's on the concert, and it's a 12-minute piece, and it has a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, I think this was, I had not done a sound installation since graduate school. I hadn't done a sound installation here at Stetson. Um, and I'm very thankful that I took the opportunity to try this out again because I realized how much I missed it. Um, and so I think going forward in my creative work, I think uh, I'm going to be seeking out a lot more opportunities to do this kind of work, this kind of sound installation work rather than the kind of concert piece-based work, basically. Not that I'm going to totally put it aside doing kind of pieces and performances, but I'm interested in kind of diving in in the next couple of years a little bit more into sound art because uh, into sound art and sound installations because it's a part of my practice that I had kind of forgotten about and had kind of gotten dusty and rusty and I'm ready to dig it back out basically. Uh, I have a video about this but I'm trying to keep this kind of compact so we can get to discussion. If we have time during the discussion I can show you a, a little bit of a video of, of what this looked like. Um, TEDx, uh, the German Fulbright Alumni Association was putting together a TEDx event, TEDx Fulbright. It's the second ever TEDx Fulbright event. The first one was in Massachusetts, the second one was in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, they found me through my blog, through my website, and they said, hey, would you will be willing to come down and give a TED Talk for us at this event, basically? And if you don't know what a TED Talk is, it's supposed to be the a 15-minute talk of your life, basically. What it is you do, like what's, it, what's important, what are you passionate about? Um, and I, of course, said, yeah, sure. I you know, booked my ticket like a week later before they even promised me that they had money to reimburse me for my ticket uh, because I knew this was a good thing to be involved with. There were 12... Uh, current and former Fulbrighters that gave presentations that day in, uh, in uh, uh, Frankfurt. Uh, I was one of two current, so ten former, two current, and I was one of the current ones giving a presentation down in Frankfurt. Uh, it was, and most of the people in the audience were themselves former Fulbrighters. That was the other cool thing. Talking to people about how the Fulbright program had literally changed their lives. People that from Germany that had come to the United States and then gone back and, and seen their careers go in drastically different directions. Uh, the, the energy that day was just phenomenal. I came back on the biggest high, basically, from the, this weekend in Frankfurt. Uh, and so I'm very thankful for that presentation uh, opportunity in particular. Um, we all know as academics there's something drastically different about going to a conference at, where you have to present and going to a conference where you can just kind of sit back and take it all in. Uh, and so I was lucky enough that there was a conference going on in Bergen while I was there called the Ephemeral Sustainability Com uh, Symposium. Uh, they were tackling the issue of sound art, and this is sound art, sound installations, uh, you know, uh, sound-based works that, are, that exist more in art galleries than they do in kind of concert halls. They were wrestling with the idea of how to, um, how to document, how to curate, and uh, uh, sort of archive this material basically going forward. Um, and so I was like, well, this is in my backyard. It's related to sound art. I, don't, I, I know more about computer music, electronic music, than I do about sound art traditions. I'm going to take advantage of this to kind of get to know more of these traditions and get kind of saturated in this culture. Um, I got to meet a lot of cool people, a lot of good, uh, big names. So I've shared with uh, some of you, Katya, known, I've talked to some of the people about some of the artists that I got to meet during this conference. Uh, but it was a, a good experience, and it kind of uh, solidified uh, my earlier sentiment that I, I want to pursue more of this sound art agenda going forward with my creative practice. So we'll see how that where that goes. Um, it was at the Ephemeral Sustainability Symposium that I found out about the ZKM. 
uh, not the ZKM as an institution, but the fact that ZKM was actually putting on an exhibit of sound art at the time, a retrospective, if you will. Um, the ZKM is a very large uh, establishment in Karlsruhe, Germany, yes, uh, that focuses on media art. And to have an institution of this size focused on particularly sound art was a very unique thing uh, that was going on. And the, the exhibit ended in January, and, and I basically said, we have to get down there and see this. Uh, I also have some family in Germany and France, so we were able to kind of tie it in with a, a family visit as well. But uh, traveling down there and seeing this much sound art all uh, at, in one place at the same time was a very unique experience. Uh, I, I'm, uh, mu again, much more stimulated to kind of move in this direction. And I, I have to point out this, this picture on the upper right-hand corner is a UPIC system. <laughs> Uh, the UPIC system is a computer system that was developed by Ayanis Zanakis, a very important Greek slash French composer uh, who is key and crucial to my dissertation research in gr granular synthesis. Uh, so to turn the corner and then I, I immediately knew what that thing was and to see UPIC in place on it, I mean I had a total geek out moment there in the, in the middle of ZKM. I'm the only one freaking, about, freaking out about this workstation with the graphical notation uh, tablet basically and uh, you know, telling my wife, you got to see this. You got, you, do you realize what this is? Um, yeah, was a, that was one of the two pictures that I kind of snuck because it, it, it had very clear, pic, and I'm, I'm going to be posting this on YouTube later, so they're going to find out that I snuck a few pictures. That was the one that I was like, I have to get a picture of this because it's, it's like, again, directly related to my dissertation research. Um, one of the other venues that is uh, that was key in kind of stimulating my thinking about creative arts and uh, the direction was the Lead Galleria. Uh, they, while I was there, opened up a new venue. So the Lead Galleria is a, is a, a gallery dedicated to exhibiting sound art. Uh, it's a very unique thing that that's what they focus on. That's all they do is sound art and electronic music. Uh, and they opened up a new space while I was there. So they had a, uh, a retrospective of Peter Vogel, uh, who is a well-known uh, sound artist. He does these wonderful sculptural things out of electronics and speakers that react to you, uh, visitors in the space. Uh, they have like proximity sensors in them, so as you walk by, they start beeping and reacting to the fact that you're there, basically. Uh, they, so they had this retrospective, they had him, this is Peter himself actually uh, gesturing things. The thing I found out about uh, him, he actually, his studio is in Freiburg, Germany. Yeah, yeah so uh, it, it was good to meet him, good to talk to him. I got his address and phone number, I'm going to be looking him up basically as we tie into maybe the Freiburg program as well. Uh, but it was cool to see a retrospective of his work, and it was a cool venue to have this lead gallery that's focused just on sound art. Uh, they were kind of a big driver of kind of uh, stimulating my thinking in terms of this, this area. Um, so research, back to the technical aspect, the, the part that I proposed as my project, because we've talked enough about these distractions into this creative stuff. What is it that you were doing with your research, Nathan? Well, first let me set up where, how we got to this research project, okay? Um, is in 2003, as a graduate student, that I released a small piece of software called the Granular Toolkit. Uh, I released it out to the wider computer music ca uh, community. I posted it free on my website, and it's been a very popular download ever since. Uh, every time I go to a conference, when people see my name tag, this is the thing that people say, oh, you're the Granular Toolkit guy, basically. That's the, the kind of stock response that I get when I'm at computer music conferences. Uh, so, it, I mean, still two, 10 years later, people know me from this little bit of software that I developed as a graduate student. Um, my pr proposal as a sabbatical project and where I'm moving with my research is to kind of update this because it's been, it's gotten a little long in the tooth. It hasn't been updated in a while. I needed time to kind of dig into software again and get into this technical bit of things. And the question was how to do that. Well, in 2006, uh, I went uh, with some Stetson students to the International Computer Music Conference, which was held in New Orleans at Tulane University. Uh, we were there, uh, it's a year after Katrina, so I can talk another time about the fact that we also did some volunteer work with Habitat for Humanity while we were there, uh, which, student life, which is one of the reasons why Student Life helped us go to this conference, because we were able to tie it in with a service project as well, which was a neat experience. Uh, but while we were there, a friend of mine, uh, Tim Place, uh, who was a kind of, I guess, fellow cohort of graduate students, not at Northwestern where I went to, he went to UMKC, uh, but we kind of knew of each other's works because we were kind of graduate students going through at the same time. Uh, he was presenting a paper on this new thing called Jamoma, which was going to be a way to uh, structure Max Patches, structure computer music uh, programs so that they were reusable by other people in the community. And I got, I got kind of interested in this. 
His co-presenter on that paper was Trondelosius, who was in my previous picture as well. This was a collaborative project that they had uh, worked on. And the project from this early 2006 uh, paper uh, has only grown and attracted a community of developers. So I wanted to get in. So that I did the, the best thing I knew how. I invited Tim to come here and give a lecture. So uh, thanks to the Artists and Lecturers uh, Committee to, for supporting his visit. Uh, he gave a lecture on computer music and entrepreneurship. He also he has a, an LLC, a, a company that he's founded and sells uh, software and hardware. Uh, but he also talked to my students just about what it's like to start a company when you're in music technology. Uh, but in addition to his talk, in addition to him visiting my classes, we set a large, uh, aside a large chunk of that second day for him and I to just sit in my office and brainstorm. How can we get these two projects on the same page, basically? And we. You can't see some of the uh, whiteboard pictures there, but that's, I, I took pictures, documented all of the, our notes, basically, and we kind of had a plan about how to go forward, how to get these software projects uh, to, to merge, basically, over time. Um, so I knew I had this sabbatical coming up. How am I going to do this? How am I going to work on uh, focusing in on this project? Well, the good thing about the Jamoma project, as it's attracted people, is that it's attracted people from around the world, Okay. Uh, this is just the core developers. We have some people in South America as well. We have a few people that are interested in Korea that are, uh, that are starting to come on board. Uh, but what's nice about having a community of developers that are distributed across several continents is that we get to kind of, uh, well, one, it's interesting to collaborate with each other via Skype and via server check-ins and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, we also, once a year, try to have a workshop where we all get together. Somebody hosts everybody coming to one location and working for a week on the project just to kind of sit in the room and brainstorm. Uh, and so when I kind of started connecting the dots of, I have a sabbatical coming up, there's this really cool call for Fulbright proposals. I know a group of people that are situated in other countries. How can I connect these things, basically? So I put a call out to our mailing list. I said, hey, I'm going to apply for a Fulbright to go to another country. Who's willing to host me? Tron Losius was the first one to respond and say, look, you absolutely need to come here to Bergen. You need to come. And we'll set you up with a desk. We'll give you all the resources you need. We'll give you time and space and energy. I said, cool. That's how I picked Norway as my sabbatical, basically. So that's the connection between these two things. Um, so yeah, getting to Norway, getting settled. I thought it would be uh, interesting to share my original timeline. Uh, because I did originally apply for a, a full year Fulbright uh, and then was uh, told that, okay, you don't have a full year, you have six months. Uh, but this was my list of what I was going to do each month, okay? And in taking stock of things at the end, this is what I got done, okay? Uh, as with any big project, it takes longer than you originally anticipated, okay? But even in these two things, these two technical bits, uh, I think we've got, I've got, uh, a lot of uh, direction, a good firm foundation of where I'm going with this. Let me tackle the first one, for, uh, the, the December one first, developing the documentation. When you're starting on a programming project, on an open source project where you're trying to plug in with a group of developers, uh, it's sometimes hard to kind of work through the code and figure out which way, it, which end is up, okay? Um, and so one of the things that was suggested to me by Tron was, hey, our documentation needs some work. Why don't you work on, as you're studying the code, writing some documentation, and then we can kind of edit that documentation to make sure that it's in line with what it actually does, basically. And so I found that helping develop the documentation for the project was a valuable way to get plugged into the project, to get deeper into my understanding of it. Uh, and I've talked to some other people with other open source projects about how to get involved. I, th I think probably my, my first uh, suggestion to people that are wanting to get involved with open source projects now is if you if you want to do it and the, the, the documentation needs work, start working on the documentation because you'll come out the other side with a better understanding of what the code is actually doing. Um, now the technical bits, the supporting code, okay? I have to, uh, I guess, set this up as a, the problem with uh, buffers. So if, let me first explain what a buffer is. In computer, pro, uh, computer music speak, a buffer is a chunk of RAM that holds a sound file. Okay, so you load a sound file into the uh, RAM, and then other users, other processes access that sound file and do things to the sound file, basically. So that, that's kind of what a buffer is. In a sense, it's like a container. I can put things into it, and then other people can pull things out of it, okay? And what happens in a lot of computer music programming languages is that the putting things in and pulling things out, they don't talk to each other. And so sometimes a new thing is put in right in the middle of your, your, your process that's trying to pull data out, okay? It'd be equivalent to this. If I said, uh, I don't know, I'll call on Rusty. Who's your favorite living author? 
You don't have one? I figured you would say your wife, but no? She's not around. She's, not around. Uh, she's a poet. Okay, okay. Well, we'll go with poet, okay. So, Terry Wedick? Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I should have paid you the 20 bucks before the lecture. <laughs> um, you go into the library, and this doesn't have, I mean, I'm assuming you can go pull stuff off the shelf in your house, right? But if somebody goes in the library, asks for the, the latest Terry Wittick book, right? Okay, I want the newest Terry Wittick book. You go home, you start reading it. You're right in the, you're right between poem four and poem five when Terry releases a new book, okay? You went to the library asking for the latest book, and so the librarian being a good librarian says, you wanted the latest Terry Wittick book. I don't care the fact that you're in between poem four and five. I'm going to switch it out with the latest Terry Wittick book, and you keep reading, basically. I hate, you hate when that happens, right? That's kind of what happens with buffers in a lot of computer music languages. And it's a big problem, because if, you wanna, if you're reading through a sound file, you want to keep reading through that sound file until you're done. Okay. And so what took me a lot of mental energy, what took me a lot of time and space, was figuring out how to solve this problem. Uh, and I'm very confident that where I am now is something that's a a, a, an innovation that I will be looking to publish here in the next year or so. Okay, uh, I just need time to write it up. So that's my summer grant proposal. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, anyway, um, okay. My early concept as far as how to deal with this was to do something that's called a double buffer. This is kind of borrowing some terminology from uh, visual programming, where you actually have one where you, one buffer where you're writing to, one buffer that you're pulling from, and they never kind of interact with each other. This reduces kind of flickering and animation simulations, that sort of thing. Um, I realized that this was not going to kind of get me to where I wanted, so I started rethinking things, started sketching a lot of things out, bouncing ideas off of Tron, bouncing ideas off of Tim. Tim uh, lives and works in Kansas City, so I was still using Skype to bounce ideas off of him, that sort of thing, working within the community of developers. And so what I've come up with is another model, another way for a sound file buffer to work in computer music languages. Okay, And it goes something like this. Okay. I tell the buffer I want to load a sound file, okay? It loads it into a matrix. A matrix is nothing more than an n-dimensional object, right? And for sound files, those two dimensions are the samples in the buffer and the channels in the sound file, okay? That's your two dimensions of your matrix. For those of you that are more science-y, matrices type people, okay? Um, it loads it into the matrix, it holds onto it, and the user comes up and says, hey, I would like the latest sound file, okay? And the buffer says, Varsagu, you go over here, and I'm going to give you the information on where to find the sound file, and everybody's happy. I'm using this sound file now that's loaded into this matrix. Okay. User number two comes along and says, hey, Buffer, I would like the latest sound file. Okay, well, this user number one, he's still over there using it, but you can go ahead and go slide over there and you can use it too. Okay. Everybody's happy. Everybody's using the latest sound file. But while these two users are using the first sound file that's loaded into the first matrix, the second, uh, a call comes in and says, hey, I want you to load a new sound file. And so what the, the thing that I've built now does is it loads it into a new segment of RAM, a new section of memory, and doesn't interrupt the first two users who are still using the old sound file. Okay? And it basically says, okay, user two says, I'm done using the sound file, and I'm going to check in, and I'm, gonna, I'm done. Okay? And the buffer keeps track of the fact that user number one is now done using the sound file. Um, meanwhile, user number three comes up and says, hey, I would like the latest sound file. Yes? Okay. So, Varsagu, you just slide over. And Varsagu is like, uh, Norwegian for be so, be so kind. It's like when you hand somebody something. Sorry if I'm, uh, okay. Slide over. Okay. Take this sound file and, and work with it. Okay. Uh, so now the buffer knows that user one is using matrix one, user three is using matrix two, and matrix two is the latest sound file. That's the newest one for any new calls that come in, basically. So, Meanwhile, user one checks in and says, hey, I'm done with this. I'm cool. I'm done. I don't need this sound file anymore. Buffer does a check and says, okay, now there's no more users using the sound file. It's okay for me to get rid of that matrix because it's not being used anymore. And everybody who comes into me wants the latest sound file anyway because you always want to be reading the latest and the greatest sound file, right? Um, so it's okay for me to get rid of that thing and to remove it from RAM, okay? So user three checks out, says, I'm done with it. But Buffer knows that Matrix 2 is still the latest sound file. And until Matrix 3, the call to load a new sound file, comes in, it will not destroy Matrix 2. It will not get rid of it. Okay? That's kind of the system that I was setting up. And the, the kind of working title for this is that it's a buffer as a librarian rather than a buffer as a container. Okay? 
So, and getting this to work was a lot of programming, a lot of mental space, a lot of figuring out how to manage, how to monitor the check-in and check-out process, that sort of stuff. Uh, I built, the nice thing about Jamoma, we have a testing environment built into the project overall. So I'm able to run tests really quickly after I compile code using Ruby. And you can see these passes that are here on the, the left-hand side. That means that everything worked in my code. Okay? And you say, so what? Let me hear something, right? Because I thought you were a computer musician. It doesn't matter if you get a script that prints out to the window. I want to actually hear what this is doing, okay? So you would be justified to ask for that. So here's what I did. I set up a wavetable, and wavetable synthesis is, very, is pretty fundamental to computer music. Effectively, what you do, and I'm going to be on camera, you basically draw what you want the waveform to look like, and then you repeat it over and over and over again. And that generates your timbre for your sound file. Okay? And depending on whether you draw this shape or this shape or this shape, okay, you get different timbres out of the computer. Okay? And what I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to load and unload these different wave shapes into RAM on, on the fly dynamically and have it when, when, as you're cycling through this waveform, wait until you get to the end of the waveform. And at that perfect moment, if there is a new matrix loaded, then switch. But if there's nothing waiting, just keep repeating. And certainly don't stop here. You want to stop here and move to the next wave file. Okay? So that's the test that I set up. And I literally got to this point a week before I left. Okay? So talk about getting it down to the wire. Okay? Um, so the old way is to just wait for changes to come in, and it's going to be a little goofy for me to work on this monitor. Wait for changes to come in and switch as soon as a change request is re ready. And you get things like this. You get things, let's see, like that. You see these? See, this is not good, okay? So when you hear this, this is, this is what, if I can turn my sound up, this is what this sounds like. Okay, that timbre shifting that you hear, this is meant to be a stress test. I'm doing this really quickly, much faster than you would ever hope to do in real-time situation because I wanted to make sure the system could handle a stress test, basically. But this really fast switching, if you hear the clicks that are happening, again, if I scroll across here, those clicks are things like this. That's not good, okay? So change, let's uh, stay in Amadeus, switch to this, okay? This is the new and improved version. Let me play it for you before I show it to you. Because this is, again, this is generated in real time. Yeah, the clicks are gone. And again, if I zoom in here, I get these nice transitions. Let me see if I can find one. Between my different wave shapes. There's one right there. So I move from a sine wave to a sawtooth wave right there. And it happens right at this moment because what happened during this cycle, it received a call that said, okay, change to the sawtooth wave, but wait for that check-in, check-out process, which is going to happen here before you actually make the change. And so you go from this situation where it's happening willy-nilly whenever the calls come in to this situation where it's smooth and the, the check-in, check-out process has been decoupled. Okay? So... This is, this is where I got, basically. And this is a, this is a big, uh, I guess, innovation that has implications beyond just my uh, narrow interest in granular synthesis, which comes out of my dissertation research. This has implications in other areas of timbre research, uh, uh, timbre production for uh, computer music as well, basically. So that's basically what you can hear, a kind of audible result of a stress test of this process of checking in and checking out. What's next? Well, remember that original timeline, the fact that I got two things done, basically? That, that's the nice thing about only getting so far is that you know where you're going next, basically. Uh, and so I, I imagine here in the next couple months, the next couple years, I'm going to continue working on this as part of the Jamoma project uh, to kind of uh, build this out, to implement this in granular synthesis, to implement this in other areas where, so that we have this file transition working uh, at its optimal capacity with this buffer as librarian technique. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.